happy Mother's Day. Who got their mum a good gift? Yeah. 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 And my sister, who knows my sister, Ashley? She is the best gift giver ever. So she kind of like runs the, she like leads the way. And so, I mean, I love it. I was preaching this week. She just like kind of was like, hey, we're getting this, we're doing this. And it's amazing. Who has that, that sibling in the family? They kind of just take charge and they get all the presents and they coordinate. It's amazing. It's the best. I'm that for Andrew. So it's great. We, we tag team in that way. But yeah, so we, we really wanted to honour the women on this day. Obviously, it's a, way, a, a day to honour all of the women in your world. And really what I was thinking about when it comes to this day as I was leading up to this week and this Sunday I was like, well, we're in conspiracy theories, right? So we're talking about politics, pop culture, all of the controversial stuff. And I'm like, oh, but it's Mother's Day. You know, like most of the time in a Mother's Day service, you'll get like a lighthearted, fluffy message. They'll probably talk about Deborah or Mary or something, which, you know, we love. That's awesome. But then I thought, okay, wait a second. Like, what should we actually be talking about on this Mother's Day? What is God's heart? What is actually happening, and since what we're doing in this series is kind of exposing the schemes of the enemy, right, and what is happening in our world, since we're doing that, I thought, well, why not do that on Mother's Day as well, specifically with something that has to do with this day and is probably most relevant on this day? Because I don't know about you guys, I see the signs up in the shopping centres, Happy Mother's Day, don't forget mum, buy this present, you know, you see the ads on TV, don't forget mum, Happy Mother's Day, you see posts from people on social media that may not necessarily be Christian, you know, Happy Mother's Day, our world is really, really good at pretending to honour, if you know what I mean. But what I find is really interesting is we have this facade of the society that we live in that is very anti-God and anti-God's kingdom. And they're saying happy Mother's Day and attempting or actually trying to bring this facade that they are honouring women. But in fact, I don't know if you guys will agree with me, society actually hates women. And I'm not up here talking feminism and ready like end the patriarchy. Trust me, that's not where this message is going to go. If you see my shirt, you get a little bit of a glimpse into that. But what I find really interesting is that our society is very good at talking the talk. But when you actually look at the policies we have in place, when you look at the the way society is set out and what's happening in pop culture, what celebrities are saying, whatever the cultural narrative is, you will find, wait a second, I don't actually think we honour womanhood at all. And we're going to go into looking why that is and what God's heart is for womanhood. So specifically, what are we talking about? What is this conspiracy theory that we're going to address? Well, it wouldn't be a Mother's Day message in our conspiracy theory series if we didn't talk about abortion. I know. I told you, we're getting there. We're going deep. We're exploring. So this is a really interesting conversation because it's even more relevant to us as the church than it is outside to the world. Like some of you are like, okay, this is church. This is not the place to talk about this. Like let's talk about the Bible and Jesus and how much He loves us. Why are we talking about a political issue like this that's so controversial in church? Well, in fact, when you think about it, this abortion issue isn't just a political thing, right? When you think about it, this idea of terminating a pregnancy and what it is, I'll call it out for what it is, it is ending a life against the baby's will. What this is, it's actually a matter of the soul. It is actually a matter of the soul. See, murder is actually an eternal thing, right? You know, it's not just something that a mistake you do and it kind of goes away. No, what this is, is it's actually ending a life. So it's actually a Christian issue. What this is, is it's a morality issue. So there is no better place to talk about this within the four walls of the church, within getting Scripture, opening it up and finding what God's heart is about this topic. And this is the reality about abortion, right? In Australia alone, and this is the most recent statistic I could find, it's pretty hard to find these stats in Australia, don't know why, but what's really interesting is it is estimated that abortion kills 80,000 babies per year in Australia alone. Worldwide, it's 40 to 50 million. That is a really high number. In fact, that actually, when you look at the, um, I think the second highest was like uh, chronic heart disease or something, it was like a way lower, like, percentage of that. It is a way lower number. So really what you could say is this is the biggest killer of individuals, human beings in Australia and worldwide, if you were to look at the stats. So this is an issue that is really close to God's heart. And the reason we're talking about it on Mother's Day, 
for obvious reasons, it is most relevant to women and womanhood and motherhood. So our society doesn't actually honor mothers. It doesn't actually honor mothers because we live in a world that is very adamant on pushing this agenda of terminate your pregnancy, don't worry about your baby, but focus on your career and yourself. This is the society that we live in. So we're gonna get into the Bible, we're gonna get into the nitty and gritty and expose the scheme that is happening here. So you guys ready? All right, so what is abortion? I hope you are, I hope you had your fun today because it's about to get a little bit heavy, but we need to hear it, amen? We need to hear it. So what is abortion? Well, plain and simple, an abortion is an intentional termination of pregnancy. So a baby in the womb, it is intentionally ending the life of a baby inside the womb. And this is done through many different means, right? We have some different options medically that are very accessible in Australia and worldwide, I guess. But one of them, there are a few different ones at different stages. So before nine weeks, up to nine weeks, you have what's known as a medical abortion. Now this happens in various stages. A woman will take a pill and she will well, she'll go to a doctor. The doctor will give her a pill to take at home. And really what this is, is it stops the hormone that is responsible for feeding the baby and keeping it alive and growing. So firstly, they'll take this that stops the hormone from allowing the baby to grow. Then they'll wait 36 to 48 hours hours and they'll go through a second stage of medication. This next medication they take really is responsible for expelling the baby from the womb. So it kind of gets rid of everything inside the womb and flushes it out. And what's crazy is I was looking at um, a secular like health article and researching into this and what it involves and the wording that they use is, oh, you know, as a woman, if you do this, you may find some like clots of blood and some tissue. I'm like, what? Some tissue. No, what you'll find is parts of a baby that you have intended to kill. So this is pretty intense. And then up until 14 weeks, you have what's another, a second procedure, I guess. It's called the surgical abortion. Now, what this involves is a woman will go to a doctor and it's done in a, a clinic, in a doctor's clinic, and they will use this device. It's a suction device. And they will pretty much starve the baby inside. They will uh, inject this thing that starves the baby. And then they will suck out the parts of the baby through a little tube. So this happens up until 14 weeks. After that, it gets a little bit more intense. So obviously, it's kind of similar. This is a late-term abortion, which happens second trimester onwards. What happens is it gets a little bit harder to suck a baby out of a tube because they're bigger. So what they have to do then is late-term abortion. They have to use forceps. They have to rip apart the baby limb from limb. They crush the skull, and then they suction then out each part of the baby's body. So they will start to pull out limb from limb and then pull out the parts of the skull and then suction out the rest of the stuff that hasn't yet come out yet. This is a late-term abortion. In Australia, this is legal. This is legal. And in fact, in the ACT, they actually just recently passed this law that up until 14 weeks, so a surgical abortion, up until 14 weeks, you can do this and it is completely covered by Medicare. That's insane. So this is the whole reality about abortion. This is what we are working with. And what's crazy about this is it is as barbaric as it sounds. And it is no different to the ancient child sacrifice rituals that we see all throughout history and in the Bible. In fact, God actually talks to this issue specifically. In Jeremiah 7, we see God is speaking to Jeremiah the prophet and he's pretty much addressing this exact issue. They were using this as a means of worshiping to worship to false gods. Look at what he says in Jeremiah chapter 7. Here it is in verse 30. It says, The people of Judah have done evil in my eyes, declares the Lord. They have set up their detestable idols in the house that bears my name and have defiled it. They have built the high places of Topeth and the valley of Ben-Himon to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire, something I did not command, nor did it enter my mind. So beware, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when people will no longer in, the, in Topeth or the valley of Ben-Himon, but the valley of slaughter. For they will bury the dead in Topheth until there is no more room. Then the carcasses of this people will become food for the birds and the wild animals, and there will be no one to frighten them away. I will bring an end to the sounds of joy with glad and gladness to the voices of bride and bridegroom in the towns of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem, for the land will become desolate. 
pretty intense language, right? God is pretty much saying to a group of people, his people, that are sacrificing their children for whatever reason. For most of the time in this case, it was for a better future, right? I need crops to feed my animals and eventually feed my family. So let me offer up my child as a sacrifice so that the God of the rain can come down and give me crops. This was the whole idea. You are sacrificing a child for the sake of a better future. So it is no different to what we are doing now. Now it's just behind closed closed doors and it's squeaky clean and it's covered under healthcare, right? Same thing. And look at what God says is He brings pretty intense judgment on this. He's like, you know, the guy that you call like the valley of this, this, all the nice fluffy joy, laughter. It's no longer going to be that. It's going to be the land of slaughter and you guys are going to cry out. But there will be nothing left. So God really says, pretty much what this is saying is a nation that is offering up this sacrifice through abortion or the murder of children, a nation will not go unpunished. These nations will not go unpunished. So we as Christians, obviously we stand before God. This is our country, right? And what we pray for is that God would be in this country and have His way. How can we as Christians kind of take a, I'll just sit on the sidelines and watch it happen and be like, oh well. This is what many churches are doing. This is the stance that many churches have is like, oh well, it's a political thing. I'll leave it to politics. We'll just do the church thing. This is the whole point. God is so serious about this. He cares so much about this issue. So therefore, you as a Christian who represents God should care about this as well. Amen? Amen. All right. So before we get into the schemes, I thought it would be pretty interesting to go through the main arguments for abortion because I don't know if you're like me, I'm pretty passionate about what I believe, but there was a time where I actually had no clue what I was talking about. So I would say, yeah, abortion is wrong. And then someone would give me an argument and I'd be like, oh, I don't know. I'm going to have to check on that. So I think it's actually like I'm saying, it's the best place to talk about it within the church because we as as representatives of God and His Word, we are mouthpieces for what the will of God is, right? We're supposed to say, hey, this is wrong and this is why it's wrong. This is what the Word of God says and this is what the facts are. Amen. So do you want to be equipped with some knowledge and some wisdom around this issue? Great. I'm glad. Get your Bibles and notebooks out. Take some notes. It's going to be good. So there are a few main arguments when it comes to this issue of abortion in the world. This is what you'll hear. First one, you may have all heard it. My body, my choice. Who's heard that one? Yeah, that's their favourite one to say. It's like a fun little slogan apparently. My body, my choice. Well, scientifically and logically, this is just not true, right? Anybody like science? You guys will know what I'm talking about. I actually don't really enjoy science, but I went into it because this is really interesting. So a baby has its own DNA inside the mother's womb. So it is a separate being. It is not your body, it is not your choice. This is how you bring this conversation to someone. How many fingers does a pregnant woman have? Count if you don't know. 10, 10 fingers. Why not 20? We don't say women have 20 fingers. We don't say they have four arms and four legs. Why is that? Because you have 10 fingers and the other 10 fingers are the fingers of a baby that is inside your womb. That is a separate body with its separate fingers. So this is the whole idea, right? What about this one? Do you think that it would be okay or should there be any intervention with a woman who is pregnant and she is taking crystal meth? 100%. But why? It's her body. She can do what she wants with it. You don't get to tell her what to do with her own body. But wait a second. No, it's it's wrong if a woman takes uh, any kind of drug that is going to harm a baby. Why is that? Because she is not only harming herself, she is harming now another human being that doesn't have a choice in the matter. She is affecting the life of another human being. So this idea is actually a logical fallacy, right? When you start to pull apart this argument, it's inconsistent. This is what I love about the pro-life movement and ideology is it's actually so consistent. This is why I feel so comfortable standing in this. It is so consistent. So my body, my choice. What's the next one? Well, we have personhood, right? When does life begin? Now, the Bible actually talks about this and I thought it would be really cool to get what we know from the Bible and then we're gonna go into philosophy and science as well. So we're gonna kind of explore all angles. Is that all good with you guys? So this is really cool. So God speaks this. Obviously, we have verses like Jeremiah where, uh, sorry, um, 
what is it, Psalm 139, where it's like, I formed you in the womb and I knew you. Those are the common ones that we know. But I found one that's really interesting in the New Testament and it actually relates directly to Jesus himself. So look at this in Luke chapter one. Luke chapter one, verse 41. When Elizabeth heard that Mary, Mary's greeting, so Mary, the mother of Jesus, she was pregnant with Jesus, she goes to Elizabeth's house. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was, was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Exclaimed, blessed are you among women and blessed is the child you will bear. But I am so favoured that the mother of my Lord should come to me. As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord will fulfil his promise to her. So beautiful, so beautiful. So firstly, um, we hear the word baby is used. Now, what's interesting about this in the original language, it actually goes a little bit deeper. It's the word uh, brephos. Brephos, which is actually the same Greek word that they use in the next chapter for a child outside the womb. Yeah. So in Luke chapter one, you hear this word, this Greek word brephos used for a baby inside the womb. Yeah. Luke chapter two, you hear the word brephos used for a child outside of the womb. The Bible uses the same word to distinguish a baby in the womb and outside of the womb. Why? Because they are the same thing. The only difference is location. Right. So this is the whole idea, right? God says, you know, baby, inside the womb and outside the womb, the same thing. What about this next one? Elizabeth filled with the Holy Spirit, right? So this is by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. This is the Word of God. She says, who am I to be standing in the presence of my Lord's mother? Yeah. So she actually in that moment says that Jesus is Lord already. Already in the womb as a baby, Jesus is Lord. See, this is the whole point, right? This moment of the incarnation doesn't just happen when Jesus is born. He is fully man and fully God at the moment of conception. We see this is the divine will of God, right? The Holy Spirit comes and conceives this Son of God. This is the moment that He became Lord, right? On earth. Obviously, He was there since the beginning, you know what I'm talking about. But as a human being, fully man, fully God, the moment that He started to develop inside the womb. This is the Holy Spirit speaking. What about this? This is a beautiful thing too, is we read here that the baby inside Elizabeth's womb leaped for joy. Leaped for joy. I don't know about you guys, but a clump of tissue can't have joy. The Bible ascribes emotion to a baby. Joy is an emotion and it is experiences emotion in the womb. This is something that an object cannot have, but a person can have, amen? Yeah. So this is what the Bible says. In fact, it's pretty interesting. I was reading some of the laws in Exodus and in Exodus kind of, we, we see this, there's many laws in Exodus, but we see this one particular law. It's in Exodus chapter two. You can read it in your own time where God is pretty much giving laws about murder and whether it's accidental or on purpose, whatever. And pretty much what we learn is if you were to murder someone, if it is an accident, or actually if it is on purpose, it is life for a life. Yeah. So if you purposely murder someone, that is murder, and the payment is life for a life. So you'd be sentenced to death, right? This is under the Noahic covenant. But if you were to commit some sort of murder and it was an accident, right? So it wouldn't be murder, it'd be manslaughter. If you were to accidentally kill someone, it's a little bit of a lesser punishment. You'd still be punished, but what, what would happen is you would have to go to one of the six cities of refuge until the high priest would die. Then when the high priest died, you could kind of come back and plead your case again and there would kind of be some sort of resolve. But this is the whole point. We read in Exodus, God is specifically talking about laws about harming a pregnant woman or her child. And get this, if you intentionally hurt a pregnant woman, same thing applies. It's a life for a life. So if you hurt your, a pregnant woman or the child inside of her, it is life for a life. God considers the life inside the womb a life that has the same value as one outside of the womb. That's the first part of this. What about this? What happens if it's an accident? Funny enough, it's a life for a life. It is not you go to one of the six cities of refuge, wait for the high priest to die, then come back like every other law. No, this one is a little bit different. It goes a little bit deeper. Now this one is, no, even if it was an accident, God sees this as so serious that you will pay for it with your life. This is insane because God ascribes kind of a higher value to this case than any other case. There is a deeper level of protection over a pregnant woman and her child. 
So this is the law of God. This is the word of God, which is so interesting. But if you were to talk to an atheist, you know, for all of our atheist friends who, they don't care what the Bible says. They don't care what God's law is. What are some of the arguments around this idea of personhood specifically? Well, one of them would be, okay, maybe life begins at birth, right? You know, as soon as it comes out of the womb, that's when it's considered a life. Like, okay, that's a really interesting argument. So you're saying that a baby, even if it's nine months even a, a woman is nine months pregnant, right? Just about to come out of the womb, it has less value than the few moments after it is born. That's actually crazy. That's crazy. That is illogical. What is the difference here? The difference is just location. Even at nine months, and you can ask people, they're for abortion fully like to term, like nine months fully developed, everything ready to come out and live their life. But no, this is the whole idea, right? Because my body, my choice. Until it comes out of my body, then it's me. This is the point. It's actually illogical because the only difference is location. Then people push it a little bit further. They're like, okay, well, it's not actually just location. It's also development, right? So a little bit for, uh, less further on in the pregnancy, you know, you should be able to get rid of the baby because my body, my choice. And, you know, life only begins at birth. Well, the difference here, right, is just development. Get this. A man's brain only develops within when he's in his 20s. So is a man less valuable in his, when he's four years old or 16 years old? Of course not. Because your value is not determined based on like how developed you are as a human being, right? Your value is based on the fact that you are a human being. There is life. And so then they go a little bit further, like, okay, fine, if it's not birth, then brain activity, right? Brain activity means that it is now a life. Well, not only does that happen at, from six weeks, which is super early on, many women don't even know they're pregnant at this point, but this is also illogical because when you try to apply this idea outside of the womb, it doesn't really stand. Because if, should you be allowed to kill somebody that is brain dead? No. <laughs> Should you be allowed to? No, even legally, you are not allowed to just go and see somebody who's in a medically induced coma and say, oh, well, brain dead, let's kill them, they mean nothing. Yeah. Not at all. What if, let's go a little bit further, what if you were, they were almost pretty much guaranteed to survive after like a few months, maybe like nine months? What about that? Should you be allowed to kill them before the nine months is up? Not at all. Because... Life is not life because of brain activity, Amen. right? Life is not life because of brain activity. Your idea, your value is not ascribed to you because of your brain, your development, your location. It is ascribed because you are a human being and you have life. Some people go a little bit further. They're like, okay, fine, life begins at the heartbeat, right? Which that happens as early as 22 days, 22 days. And this is what the thing is, right? Because in Texas, they passed the heartbeat bill, which is you can only abort up until the heartbeat. And the reason women were so angry was because like, well, most of the time we don't even know we're pregnant until this point. Like, well, yeah, that's the point. <laughs> we're trying to find a middle ground here, but this is the whole point is many women don't even know they're pregnant up until this point. The heart beats from so early on. So these are kind of like the atheistic arguments. Well, what's interesting is when you look at the science, because this is what we got to do, right? We've done Bible, we've done philosophy. Now let's look at the science. And like I said, I'm not much of a scientist. If I'm honest, it goes over my head completely. If you were to ask Pastor Millie, she would probably get it straight away. She's like super smart in that area, not my area. But I found this really interesting. So I like had to really ingrain this into my brain so I could share it with you guys. What's interesting is before this moment of fertilization happens in the womb, you have have what's called gametogenesis. Anyone know what gametogenesis is? Okay, one person, because you were here this morning. <laughs> nice, like it, I like it. Well, that makes me feel a little bit, bit, bit better. You guys can fact check me, it's all good. But this is a really interesting process because gametogenesis is pretty much a process of cell division. So every germ cell has 46 chromosomes. I know, get ready to learn, guys. I feel so smart, I'm not. I have to really ingrain this into my brain. Every single germ cell has 46 chromosomes. But when it comes to, uh, uh, what is it, gametogenesis, what it does is it divides the cells, it splits the cell in half, so you have cells of 23 chromosomes. Now, what's interesting about this is because what happens when the moment of fertilization is about to happen, right, the sperm kind of comes in, gametogenesis takes the parts of the sperm, so cells from the sperm, 
uh, parts from the egg and it splits them in half, so from 46 chromosomes to 23, then they're joined together to create one new cell, one mature cell. This is a process of maturation within the cells. And what's interesting about this is because this process of gametogenesis makes a completely new cell that is distinct from the sperm and the egg separately. So this is now a distinct human being that has gone a maturation process within gametogenesis. So then, only then, because the cell has to have 43, sorry, 46 chromosomes to be mature and for fertilization to happen. So this process of creating a distinct cell has to happen before fertilization. So it's actually not the mother. It's part of the mother, part of the father, but now it is its own distinct cell. So scientifically, this is a new life. Science, that is the science. And if all my scientists, you're like, yeah, but technically, I'm like, no, that is the science. Science actually says that life begins in this moment of fertilization. So this is the science, right? Next argument they have. So that was personhood. That was quite a long one. Sorry, have you got, are you guys good? Did you learn a lot? So that's the argument of personhood. The second argument, which is the one you will hear when they have nothing else to say, what about rape and incest? What about when a woman is raped? Now, can I just backtrack for a little bit and just express how this is the most tragic thing to ever happen to a woman, right? And before God, this is a detestable act. And you better believe that God will have His judgment because He is a holy and loving God. But as tragic as this is, we still need to ask the question. This is a really important question. Is should the sins of an uh, should an innocent person ever have to pay for the sins of another? Because this is a matter of justice, right? You know, all of the my body, my choice, pro-abortion women, they're all about justice, right? Is this actually just? Should an innocent person that has not done anything wrong, a baby of all things, have to pay for the sins of a father who has done an unspeakable act? This is a matter of justice. This is a question of justice. And this is the whole point, right? Is we're kind of continuing the cycle of sin. And we're expecting healing to come to women because this doesn't just affect a child, it affects a woman. We're expecting healing to come to a woman when you actually continue this cycle of sin. And we know biblically that that's not a solution. That sin isn't a solution to healing, right? Sin doesn't bring healing. In fact, it just brings more sin and more desperation for God. So this is the whole point, right? We believe in justice. If we believe in justice, sorry, then we actually cannot believe this idea that a baby should have to pay for its father's crimes. Yeah, this is the whole point. And thank God, thankfully, this, the cases of rape and abortion are as little as 2%, yeah. right? And that's being generous, 2%. And then you'd have to ask, okay, if it's 2% and you have this conversation with someone that's like, what about rape and incest? You say, first, can we first just like get this idea of, if it's 2%, is, are you okay with saying that the 98% of abortion cases are not okay? Like, should we say that that's not okay and then we can focus on the 2%? Most of the time we'll say, no, I believe it's all okay. I'm like, okay, well then you're just using this minority as an excuse to sound really loud about an opinion. So should we, should we sacrifice the 98% for the 2% that was done under a tragedy? This is the question we need to ask. Then you'll have the next one, okay, what if the mother's life is at risk? And once again, this is a very low statistic. Like this is a minority. In fact, in the US, and I didn't actually find much information in Australia. Go figure, I'm not too sure why. But in the US, they actually figure this out statistically. It counts for less than 0.118 of abortions are because of the mother's life being at risk. And in the UK, it's even less than that. It's 0.006. So if we look at this, okay, this is a very vast minority. Well, let's look at the minority for a little bit. Most of the um, complications would happen within the first trimester, right? So this is very early on, 12 weeks. And what would happen, usually if there are complications, it would result in a miscarriage. And that would is, by the way, not an abortion. And like I said in the beginning, abortion is intentionally ending and terminating a pregnancy. This is something that happens without the mother wanting it to. If you've been through that, you know what I'm talking about. So this is 
the whole point, right? So this would result in a, a miscarriage. And there is an exception to this is what's known as an ectopic pregnancy. And what happens here is the baby is actually growing in the fallopian tube. And what this means is, and I actually didn't know this, Jordan actually said this to me, she's a nurse. She said what they would actually do is they would try to move the baby into the right place before they would have to go to an extreme measure of taking the baby out because what it is, is if it grows in the fallopian tube, the baby cannot survive. And therefore, the mother cannot survive. In fact, you would have to end up killing both lives. And so in this case, which is very, it's a lot more rare, in this case, what would happen is they would try to move the baby into the right place, and if they fail, then they would have to remove the baby from the fallopian tube because there is no way of survival for either the baby or the mother. This, medically and scientifically, does not fall under an abortion. You, this is what you will hear, right? They're like, no, what about when the woman's mother, what about ectopic pregnancy? I'm like, for you to say that this falls under that is just, you don't know what you're talking about. Because statistically, legally, medically, this does not fall under an abortion. An abortion is intentionally killing a baby that is viable. And so this is the whole point, right? A woman's life being at risk is super, super rare. And then if in the case where it was to happen, so the 0.006 chance, what would happen is the doctor has a duty of care to the mother and to the baby. So what would happen is the doctor would try anything he can to try to save the mother's life and the baby's life. And what would happen is a lot of the times they are unable to save the baby. So the baby would, it would end up resulting in the baby dying. But this is so different to let's, okay, let's kill your baby for no reason. This is so different. This is, I'm going to do what I can to save the baby as well as you. And if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. But I'm going to do my duty of care as a doctor to try to help people and to try to save lives. Very big difference. This as well does not fall under an abortion, right? This does not fall medically. You know, people will say like, oh, but what about this? And I'm like, if you go to a doctor and you are actually going to die if you keep carrying this baby, a doctor is not going to tell you, sorry, it's against the law. That's not how it works. That is not how it works. This does not fall under an abortion law. So these are the main arguments, right? Everyone take a big breath. Yes, I know, we're good, we're learning stuff. So these are kind of the main arguments. And really the reason that we talk about it, like I said, is because as Christians, we have a responsibility to know what we're talking about because we're speaking for God. As Christians, you are speaking for God. You are speaking for His Word. So this is the whole point. Okay, so abortion is bad. It's really scary. It's really dirty. It's really ugly. What does this have to do with anything? Well, like I said, we're talking about it's Mother's Day and we're talking about womanhood. And this is the whole point. What we've been learning in this series is this whole idea of whatever is happening in politics, it's actually a spiritual problem. So whatever policy you see, whatever thing you see in social media or ideology that is moving around, it's not just at face value a political problem. It's actually a spiritual problem. So in saying that, What is the spiritual problem behind abortion? Well, you can see all throughout the Old Testament and the New that this problem was a thing, right? We already mentioned before the child sacrifice. But what is really interesting is this is actually an anti-kingdom ideology. Why do I say that? Well, if we look in Exodus, we see the story, you know, God's people are in Egypt and they are now being oppressed by the Egyptians. So they are under heavy oppression and Pharaoh is pretty threatened by them because they're growing at such a crazy rate. And he's like, okay, because they're growing and this kingdom is threatening my kingdom, now I'm going to give a decree that all Hebrew baby boys under two, as soon as they're born, if they're male, they will be killed. So they pretty much, he went to the midwives, the Hebrew midwives and said, hey, if your baby is born and it's a male, kill it on the spot. This is a point. What we see is like, oh yeah, just politics. It's just power play. You know, he was just scared. He wanted all of the power. That may have been what it is at face value. But really, if you see in the very next chapter, Moses is born. And we know that Moses is the man that God used to bring salvation to his people. So from a political stance, it's okay, the king wants power and he's threatened by a group of people. What we see from a spiritual lens is no, God was ready to bring salvation to his people and the the devil went behind the king's ears and said, hey, you need to kill these people, the baby boys that are gonna be born because he knew what was gonna happen. See, this is actually intentionally a scheme from the enemy to try to stop the kingdom of God from progressing with God's will. So this is the whole point, right? It's not a political 
political problem, it's a spiritual problem. Then we jump to the New Testament. 1.5 thousand years later, Jesus is born. Then we see King Herod, once again, threatened by the idea of a new king. We see this as just its power, right? It's politics, it's just a natural problem, it is what it is. What is actually happening is the devil once again seeing, okay, there's gonna be a Messiah that comes up that actually delivers the people, now not just from slavery in a practical sense, but slavery of sin, and it's not just gonna be for a time, it is going to be for eternity. So the enemy goes, okay, well, we need to stop the kingdom of God from progressing in this way, what are we going to do? Well, let's kill all of the baby boys. This is the same tactic 1.5 thousand years later. Is that a coincidence? Absolutely not. We know that. That's common sense. So what we know is behind every political idea, there's a spiritual reason behind it. So what is the spiritual reason behind this? Well, the common sense one, and what we've been learning about the kingdom of Babylon, is it's intentionally trying to end the next generation. That's kind of the common sense one. You see, well, abortion kills babies. It's kind of what he's doing, right? It's pretty common sense. But what I want to talk about tonight that's a little bit deeper than that is there's not only just one victim when it comes to abortion. It's not just the child. It's actually women as well. The other victim when it comes to abortion is not just the child. It is women. And this is my whole point, right? Society is talking, happy Mother's Day. We honor women. We love motherhood. They actually don't because they are killing babies in the womb. And they are inflicting pain and oppression on women. See, this is the point. The enemy is on an aggressive scheme to bring down God's design, specifically in women. Why is that? Why do I say that? Well, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but motherhood is a divine call from God that is exclusive to women. Motherhood, let me say that again. Motherhood is exclusive to women. So, I don't know if you guys saw a video that was kind of going around on social media. I think it was like, I don't know, maybe a year ago now, of these two men who claim to be women. And they have just recently adopted a baby or through surrogacy, I don't even know what the situation was, but a newborn baby is crying out, he wants milk. And they're trying to breastfeed These men are trying to breastfeed this little baby. And this was actually really sad. I didn't laugh at this. I actually was like, this is tragic. Not only this poor baby is in this situation, but these men actually need help. They actually need help. They are living in a delusion that goes against nature and common sense. But this is the whole point, right? This is what society is pushing this idea. And I don't know if you guys have noticed, but this whole transgender ideology, it's kind of specifically aimed at women. And I know that there can be men that transition to women and women that can transition to be men. But really, when you think about it, why are we asking what is a woman? Why don't we ask what is a man? Interesting question. What about this? When you look at sports... The biggest conversation we're having right now in sports is the idea of biological men that are transitioning to be women and are now participating in sports, which is incredibly unfair to biological women, right? Why is it that we don't see any biological woman transitioning to be men and jumping into men's sports? It's not really heard of, right? That's because societally, what we can see is it's actually a war on womanhood. It is a war on womanhood. So like I said, motherhood is exclusive to women. This is the whole idea. And what's interesting about this is what I was looking at when it comes to the Word of God and science and all this kind of stuff, I found it really interesting because this idea of womanhood and motherhood are actually woven together biblically, right? And I'm gonna prove it to you. When you look in the very beginning, the first thing that we see when you see Adam and Eve, Adam says, I'm gonna call her Eve and she will be the mother of all living. So Eve actually means the mother of all living. What's interesting is this idea of she will be called woman and she will be called Eve. She will be called mother. This idea is they are woven together. This idea of being a mother is actually a part, it's a key identifier for what it is to be a woman. Now let me prove it to you. Who likes biology? Who, who loves their period? Women. We're going to learn a little bit about your period. This is really interesting, right? Because men and women are so different. Like not even just the normal stuff. Like I went into it and I was like, whoa, wait a second. This is crazy. When it comes to the cycles, men operate under a 24-hour cycle. 
So what this means is you guys wake up and your testosterone spikes and you've got so much energy. You're at peak performance first thing in the morning. So if you sleep in, try it the other way. You might actually get better results. That's how your body works. So they actually have more energy in the morning and this kind of carries them through the afternoon. And by the time it starts to get late in the afternoon, you know, it's getting later, the sun is starting to set, they start to get tired. Their testosterone dips a little bit. And then they sleep and wake up and then the same thing happens over and over again. It's a 24 hour cycle. Now, women, we're a little bit different. And this is what's really funny is because I was reading some articles about this and trying to find, and I'm looking a lot from like secular point of view, stats and stuff, because it's all science-y. And what's interesting is these articles kind of are trying to build a case for feminism. Like, oh, like society is quite literally built by men and for men because the 24-hour cycle and the workday kind of sync together. And I'm like, girl, you understand the sun rises at a certain time and sets at a certain time. So it's not because society made this up. This is actually creation speaking. So it's almost like God made and designed men to function with the way that a day works. Get up, go to work, get tired when the sun goes down, get up, do it all again. It's almost like God designed it like that. But women are a little bit different. And I'm not saying women, you can't work. Don't at me, it's all good. But this is what's really interesting. Women operate under a 28-day cycle. Not 24 hours, 28 days. And this is pretty crazy. So what it is, what pretty much what happens, a woman enters her follicular phase, right? So 10 to 14 days this usually takes. Starts kind of within her period, but she goes through the follicular phase and her body is getting ready for ovulation. Ovulation, what that means, women are most fertile. And this is pretty interesting because she is at her most happy. She's at her most energetic. So men, if you want to know, we're most happy when we're ovulating. I'll give you a bit of a hint. So they're most happy, they're most energetic. And what's really interesting about this is because they actually have some physical changes that go on. So a woman's face structure, the bone structure in her face shifts slightly and it makes her face more symmetrical. Your cheekbones raise up a little bit, you look a little bit prettier. So plan things that you wanna look good in when you're ovulating. That's all I'll say, women. So what's interesting about this too is their face, actually the skin glows, it has a natural glow, and they have a natural blush to their cheeks. So what's funny about this is because blush was kind of designed for that reason, men actually find that more attractive, apparently. So what's interesting about this is women, we're kind of like peacocks. We're like, hey, I'm pretty, it's time. That's really what our body is saying. And so you may not even be trying to have a baby, but you better believe your body is. And so this is the whole point of ovulation, right? We're fertile, we're ready to have a baby, this is the whole idea. Then a woman enters her luteal phase. And this is pretty much the body assumes that you are going to have a baby. It assumes after ovulation period, you know, you're fertile, something, something happened, you know, I looked all pretty, something must have happened. And now it's like, okay, I'm ready to have a baby. I'm ready for the fertilization process to happen. And this is cool because what happens is your immune defenses as a woman drop and have a decrease in this time. Why is that? Well, because if you were to have a you know, a baby, if you were to have this new foreign entity inside your body, your immunity would see that as a threat and see it as something that's different and shouldn't be in here and will start to attack that sperm, that cell. And so what happens is your body during this time and specifically in this time, it's ready to, for fertilization to happen so your immune defenses kind of decrease to allow that egg to implant and to allow for pregnancy to happen. And so your body in every area is trying to have a baby, is wanting to have a baby. So whether you want to or not, your body does. And then obviously if a woman doesn't have a baby, then she'll get her period and then it starts all over again. So that's a woman's 28 day cycle. A little bit different to a man's 24 hour cycle, right? So this is really interesting. What we see from here is biologically, being a woman is really, her cycle really revolves around the idea of having babies. And now maybe you're like, okay, are you saying that if a woman can't have babies then she's not a woman? Of course I'm not saying that. Don't be dumb. That's not what I'm saying. There are exceptions to this. And how do I explain this? Because I know we live in a, a sinful world, right? So the result of that, tragically, many women struggle with infertility. And that's a whole other thing we can go into, but it's part of the reason we live in a sinful world and it's a tragedy. But we're not going to relabel what it is to be a woman because of the exception to what being a woman is. What do I mean by that? Let me use the fingers analogy again. How many fingers does a human being have? 10. Well, wait a second. Some don't have 10 fingers. 
Some people have nine. Some people are born with more. So should we redefine how many fingers human beings have? Because they're the exception of some that don't have fingers or don't have as many? No, because naturally and by design, human beings are supposed to have 10 fingers. Naturally, by design, women are supposed to be able to get pregnant and have a baby. It's the same concept. So that's why when a woman is struggling to have a baby, she's gonna go to the doctor and say, hey doctor, there is something wrong, I cannot have a baby. If a man goes up to a doctor and say, hey, I've been trying to have a baby and I'm struggling, the doctor's gonna be like, let me put you into a psych ward, right? Because that's not normal. The whole reason we go is because something is wrong. Naturally, women are supposed to have babies. So we see, not only biblically, God speaks this over a woman, right? She'll be called Eve, the mother of all living. And she also, Adam and Eve get this first mandate to go forth and multiply, right? Go multiply, have your babies. But this whole idea of womanhood and motherhood are woven into it, into together, not even just biblically, but biologically. This is God's design. And so how did we get to a point in history or presently, where women are now going directly against the way that God designed them to be. How have we come to a point where women are abandoning their maternal instincts to look after themselves and their own careers? How have we got here? Well, one word, maybe some of you can say it with me, feminism. Feminism, I know, the lo a lovely word. I, to be honest, you can see my shirt. Not a big fan. This is why. Many people will say, oh, you know, feminism in the beginning was really great. People like, you know, the, it was women fighting for rights. They wanted um, suffrage. They wanted the right to vote, all this kind of stuff. It was really good in the beginning. It's just taken a little bit of a turn. I'll agree with you. It has taken a bit of a turn. It has got progressively worse. But what's interesting is at its core, and since the very, very beginning first wave feminism, it really was anti-children. How do I say this? Well, you've got kind of some of the first wave feminists, you've got Susan B. Anthony, ladies like this. Really what they fought for was they, in this time, um, having a baby was increased your chance of dying. So death by childbirth was a lot higher than it is now. They didn't have the medical facilities we have now. So a lot of women would die giving birth to children. And what these women did were like, okay, it's time when, you know, times are changing, we want equal rights and, and we want to be able to go to work like a man does. But there's a little bit of a problem because we have a bit of a, a blockage to our dreams and wanting to be successful in the workplace and that's children. Not only do I have the potential to die giving birth, but once I have a child, I'm kind of having to look after that child for the next like 18 years. That's a little bit of a burden. I'm not gonna be able to go to work and to pursue a career and do what I wanna do because I have this child now weighing me down. So what they did in this, in this stage, first wave feminism, FYI, this was like the very beginning, 1800s. What they did was they, they pretty much protested. So they were like, okay, um, we don't wanna have babies and they didn't have birth control at this point. We don't wanna have babies so we're not gonna have sex with our husbands anymore. So they abstained from sex, right? So the same way nuns would abstain from sex, they were like, we're gonna abstain, but it's not because we love God, it's because we don't wanna have children, we wanna pursue a career. So this is the idea, they would abstain from sex and out of a protest for not wanting to have babies. Then you get to second wave fe feminism. Second wave feminism is where it gets interesting. Now the question was, okay, what if there was a way where we could have as much sex as we want and not be tied to the consequences of a child? This is where you hear this talk of birth control. This is where the term birth control kind of started and it was by a woman known as Margaret Sanger. Yeah. Margaret Sanger, so she was a very pro-abortion feminist crazy lady. She was crazy. She is actually the um, founder of Planned Parenthood and she came up with this term of birth control. And this is really interesting because Margaret Sanger wasn't just an activist who wanted to you know, give health to women and to allow them to have a great life. That's all, not all that she was. In fact, she actually practiced eugenics. And if you know a little bit about eugenics, this was in the same time that it was being experimented in Nazi Germany. So this whole idea of eugenics, she was a eugenicist and she practiced what, practiced what was known as selective breeding. So her whole thesis was in order to have a strong and a thriving society, what we should do is we should eliminate the weak people. So she targeted specifically the poor, 
She targeted immigrants and people of color, so the black community in, the, in America. And what she did was she would start clinics, so she would plan Planned Parenthood clinics in places where there were minority groups, specifically to kind of expel the weeds. She literally called them human weeds, black people specifically. So she's like, we need to exterminate them and we need to build a thriving good society. So the wealthy white people keep having the babies. But let's actually convince these women we're trying to help them and bring health care and let's get them to kill their children so eventually that they die off. If you don't believe me, just go look at her quotes and some of her work. Now this is the thing about Margaret Sanger. She was a very passionate anti-God hater. Now let me, let me show you a little bit of a quote, something that she said. This is directly from Margaret Sanger. She says, birth control appeals to the advanced radical because it is calculated to undermine the authority of the Christian churches. I look forward to seeing humanity free someday of the tyranny of Christianity, no less than capitalism. Margaret Sanger, founder of Planned Parenthood and the inventor of birth control. Now, she sparked a movement that really birthed the sexual revolution and, you know, things kind of go all downhill from there. But this is crazy about this whole ideology is this stems from evolutionary thinking, which is atheism, right? Even Charles Darwin had experimented in this idea of eugenics and people that he was closely related to. This, and this you know, this guy, I can't remember his name, Malthus. It's called Malthusian eugenics, which is literally something they practiced and then was experimented in Nazi Germany. So, for my pro-abortion activists, these are the people that your ideology align with. These are the people, in fact, if you look at Planned Parenthood, just go on Google Maps and zoom in a little bit, they have massive statues of Margaret Sanger up in their clinics. Yeah. They praise her and they honour her for yeah. what she did. So somehow, feminism, this is the whole point, the result of feminism was really making women abandon their maternal instincts and out of a selfish ambition, I want to pursue a career, so I'm going to deny my maternal instinct, I'm going to deny the way that God made me, and I'm going to kill my child. And like I said, you know, there's birth control, which is one thing, but then abortion came after that. This is in the 60s, it progressed here from the sexual revolution. But this is the whole point, right? This is atheistic thinking. It's, it comes from evolutionary ideas. And what it is, or call it out for what it is, it is entirely anti-God. It is entirely anti-God. So as Christians, we are building one kingdom and what we're learning in this series is that the spirit of Babylon or the devil himself is building an anti-kingdom. And the idea of abortion is building a kingdom in opposition to God. Not only that, it is stripping women of their divine call to be mothers. And so this is feminism, it's leading to antinatalism, which is the idea that having babies is morally wrong, right? Procreation is morally wrong, because why would you bring a baby into a, such a cruel world? You're a terrible person if you do that. This is antinatalism, it stems from evolutionary thinking. In fact, this is the whole abortion movement, it stems out of this idea, and like I said, it's an anti-kingdom, which means it is a gospel issue. It is not just a politics issue, it is a gospel issue. In fact, why do I say that? It's a gospel issue. God actually reflects this idea of the gospel through the idea of what it is to be a parent. What I mean by that? Well, God is a loving father and we as his church are his children, right? This is the symbolism that God himself chooses to use to explain the relationship between God and his children. And what's beautiful about this is motherhood specifically goes a little bit deeper than this. This is so beautiful because what it is to be a mother is you as a human being, you are choosing to give up your body for the sake of another. You are choosing, and this is the whole point, it goes against the early feminists, right? First wave feminists, the ones that were all nice and, and you know, cute and wanted to just get their rights. These were the hardcore feminists as well as they are now. It was abandoning this idea of, I choose to give my body for the sake of another. There is a sacrificial love that women have that is specifically exclusive to women. We have the honour, women have the honour of experiencing this sacrificial love of choosing to sacrifice my body for the sake of another human being. Now what's so beautiful about this is when it comes to God, what God says is that this idea of pregnancy in the womb, it is actually sacred. It is sacred. How do I know this? Well, it's pretty interesting. I went into um, anatomy a little bit and the womb is considered sacred even just from 
like anatomy when you think about it is what the bone is that protects the pelvic floor, the bone is called the sacrum. And this was ancient anatomists who came up with this idea. And really what it, the reason that it was called that way is because when you look at what sacrum means, is it means sacred. It comes from this word sacred, and this is what it means. Sacrum means holy or sacred bone. And this word sacred bone means belonging to God, holy, set apart for a special purpose, right? We know this in Christianity, but get this. It means to properly immune from violence or interference. Pretty interesting. When you look at the objects in the temple that were considered sacred, they were ones that could not be defiled. They were ones that you cannot interfere with. When you look at what happened in the Bible, when the Philistines came and they took this holy object, the Ark of the Covenant, what started to happen? They all started to die off. They started to get so sick because God is saying, Do not interfere with what is sacred to God. The womb is considered sacred to God. It is a place that is belonging to God specifically, that is designed by God, that is protected by God. And as human beings, we are not allowed to interfere or bring violence against it. The only reason a womb should be dealt with is when it's in the case of helping or bringing aid and bringing life into the world. Womanhood is sacred before God. In fact, masculinity is also sacred before God. And what our society is doing, what it is convincing us is that it's very pro-woman. So pro-woman, right? You are stripping a woman of her God-given gift to bring life into the world. This is the whole point, right? If you guys really love your country, if you really love this country, you will speak about this issue. If you really love people, human beings, like many social justice warriors claim to do, if you really love human beings, then you will speak on this issue. And the church is the place where we need to talk about this because it is a matter of the soul. And what I wanna say in this moment is like I'm saying, it's a matter of the soul. There is no better place than in the church to talk about this because the world cannot solve the hurt and the pain that comes through this sin. The fact is, if you have ever gone through an abortion, if maybe you are a male, maybe you are a man and you know, you've assisted a woman that you were not necessarily married to and you know, it was a bit of shame attached to having a baby outside of wedlock, so you're like, go like, take care of it. Maybe that's your situation. What I wanna say to you, what is absolutely biblical, is the only place that you will feel peace in your soul, the only way you will have peace before God about this is if you repent and come into the holy presence of God and bring this sin before Him and choose now that you will turn from your ways and now start to fight for the Kingdom of God. This is what this series is for. This is why we are debunking the conspiracy theories. If you wanna fact check me, go for it. This is the reality of our world, that this is happening and it is building an anti-kingdom. And we as a church, we can take moments like Mother's Day to be all fluffy and yeah, we love mum. Or we can talk to the real issues that are actually trying to destroy motherhood and truly honour and glorify 